Today's lesson starts with species interactions. How organisms depend on each other was a whole idea of interconnectedness from a previous video. Today we're going to go through several different types of species interactions and the term will explain how they interact with one another. Predation, that is the idea of a predator-prey relationship, which some of you may have a background on, um, from organisms that you know from around TV shows, things that you've seen, documentaries. This is where one organism is helped while the other is harmed. The one being helped would be the predator, the one being harmed would obviously be the prey. So throughout the evolution, um, organisms that survived had reasons they survived is because they had defense mechanisms. For example, mimicry. Mimicry is a prey defense where a non-poisonous variety of an organism resembles that of a poisonous variety. So they kind of avoid being eaten or preyed upon because they look so close to a poisonous version that the predator may not take the chance that that actually is the non-poisonous version. The most common example is a monarch butterfly, which is a poisonous variety. You are more than welcome to Google image what a monarch butterfly looks like. And a viceroy, viceroy, V-I-C-E-R-O-Y butterfly. If you Google image that butterfly, you would probably see that they look very, very similar. The monarch being the poisonous and the viceroy being the non-poisonous. There's an example of mimicry. Secondary compounds are for plants. Plants need to be, they're a very easy target for organisms that feed on plants. So secondary compounds are chemicals that are secreted by plants to avoid being eaten. So think of poison ivy. You wouldn't go and put poison ivy as your salad, whereas spinach doesn't have that opportunity. So some of them have defense mechanisms to prevent from being eaten or being prey. Parasitism is defined as identical to that of predation, where one is helped while the other is harmed. The parasite itself is the portion that is helped. The host is the organism that is harmed. The subtle difference between a predator-prey and parasite, how you would differentiate these, is the purpose. A parasite does not want to feed on or kill the host. It relies on the host for its own survival somewhat. So the different categories of parasites are endoparasites, where endo means within, if you recall things like endocytosis, that is a form of active transport where things come into the cell, so use that same prefix here. Endoparasites are things that live on the inside of the host. Can you think of any examples off the top of your head? Uh, were you thinking a lot of the, the worms, the tapeworm? That's a clear example of an endoparasite. Ectoparasites are outside. So they attach themselves to the outside of a host. Can you think of any examples of ectoparasites? Mosquitoes, um, leeches, things like that where they kind of are uh, feeding on the outside. So you can kind of see these guys. They're a little bit easier to treat than endoparasites, given that you might not even know they are there. The next version of species interaction is something called competition. So competition, you know, because many of you are involved in competition, but let's see how it relates to ecology. Competition is when organisms have an overlap of realized niches. Recall from a few videos ago that realized niches are the roles that an organism plays. So can you think of two students that are in the classroom that have a similar niche in the class and they somewhat compete with each other, maybe for the spotlight, for the attention, for the, the voice in the class? That's competition. It literally is an overlap of two individuals that want the same exact thing. When you're competing for a trophy, one thing you both want that, to be that champion, so you're competing for that same realized niche. Organisms will do the same thing. The realized niche might be the, you know, the, the head male, the alpha male, they got to compete for that. Mutualism is when both organisms will benefit from a situation. So think of two organisms that both rely on each other. A lot of examples are pollinators, such as flowers, uh, or pollinators such as bees and the flowers that they pollinate. So bees and flowers are somewhat a mutualistic relationship. One feeds by pollen, and then the 
insect, bee, whatever, would somewhat pollinate the next flower so it's helping the flowers reproduce. So that's a good example of mutualism. Commensalism is where one organism benefits, the other is unaffected. So the most common example might be the sea anemone, um, where the sea anemone and the clownfish. The clownfish seeks shelter in the sea anemone, so that benefits the clownfish, but the sea anemone gets nothing. A lot of, you know, you just got to know how they, they react to each other. So you got to find a way to prove that if we say, how are these two organisms mutualistic or commensalistic, then just have to find out, well, do they both have a way to benefit from each other? If you can only find a benefit to one organism, the other one doesn't get a, a benefit or harmed, then you have a commensalism. The next terms, succession. Um, succession is defined as the sequential growth or regrowth, in some cases, of a stable ecosystem. We learned that an ecosystem is the third level of hierarchy. We went from populations to communities to ecosystems. And an ecosystem just doesn't build overnight. There, there's a pretty sequential sequence or sequential um, picture that has to happen before you get to the stable end game. There are two types of succession. There's primary succession. Primary succession is, in essence, starting from scratch. You have no wildlife. You have no soil. You start from basically rock. That is your surface. And from there, you build into a stable ecosystem, which we showed you a picture of an ecosystem a few days ago or in another video where it could be trees, brush, you know, animals are living there, all that stuff. So here's a picture of a primary ecosystem. So we start with pretty much barren rock. In order to get soil, what you start needing to do is have what are called pioneer species. So pioneer species can attach to rocks. So think of organisms that can attach to rocks, such as moss, they attach easily to rock. This other form of organism called a lichen, L-I-C-H-E-N. Those are organisms that are pioneers. They're the first to, to kind of get there. They don't need much. So what they do is they latch onto the rock and those, the, the tiny roots that they have, some of them will break away the rock and start eroding it. And then the pioneer species will decompose and that puts organic molecules, which allow growth of other things. So it starts the seed to start growing other organisms. In the second, we now have soil. So you're going to get grasses. So this picture is showing how there's grasses involved. So it's the first um, change that happens from the rock. Then the grasses give rise to small shrubs, uh, trees. And the final video, uh, picture here is where the small trees and bushes and shrubs would give rise to the the forest, the trees, the large. There are a differentiate some pictures will actually differentiate between the formation of what are called the softwood trees versus like there's pine trees versus hardwood trees, which are thinking of trees that would would be your hardwood floors. You don't put pine as your floor. You do oaks and maple, you know, those types of things. And and pines would be there before hardwood. So softwood before hardwood in terms of uh, ecosystem formation. That final picture here, Roman numeral four, is what's known as the climax community. So the climax is the stable end to an ecosystem. This would support all of the living species in that ecosystem. So that would be the stable end point. Secondary succession is slightly different. It keeps the role the same way, but the accompanying diagram shows these changes after a forest fire. So this is where there was a potential stable ecosystem, but it went away, such as a forest fire would bring that down. It doesn't go back to, to barren rock. So we're going to go back and think of examples where primary succession actually takes place. So here's an example of secondary succession where a forest fire brought it back down basically to the soil, and then it has to regrow the grass and shrubs. It doesn't have to bring the, prim the pioneer species in any longer. So that's the big difference between primary and secondary. Did you need those pioneer species? So this would be one example, a forest fire. Can you think of another example that would be a secondary succession? 
Other examples include floods. Natural disasters are often your secondary succession. Think of this version, though, back up to primary. When would you just have rock? You'd have no soil. Obviously, the beginning of origin of Earth. But things are happening even currently, primary succession. That could be after a volcanic eruption. When that cools, you're basically down to a rock. So that island that forms potentially from a volcanic eruption, there you have, you're starting from scratch. Other examples are uh, melting glaciers. Underneath those glaciers, there's no soil. That's, that's pure rock there. So that's going to be another example of pioneer species and primary succession. So what I'll do is I'm probably going to stop here because the next section is on energy and that's going to take a little bit more time than I have left on this snippet of a video.